Welcome or welcome back to Data Science for Everyone. This video is all about data science programming fundamentals, the building blocks of programming that you will need as a data scientist. If you've done some programming previously, you may already know a lot of this. If you haven't done any programming, definitely stick around. If you've done some programming, but maybe it was a while ago, it's probably worth a refresher. This is not unique to data science, but these are the pieces that we will be building a lot of our programs from later on in the course. So the first thing I want to talk about are data types. Every time you import a data set into your program, every item in that data set is going to have a type. And it's very important to know what type of data you have and to know whether we might need to change it to another type, if we can change it to another type. Really what we mean by a data type is it's a way of categorizing data or, or it's an indicator of what values our data can take on what operations we can perform on it, and how it's stored. Those three things are really going to matter if we're trying to do particular types of analyses, and we'll get more concrete in just a moment. So for example, one data type is an int, that's a number, and that could be a seven. Another data type is a string, and this phrase data science in quotes is a string. We'll break it down in a moment, but that's what we're referring to. If you've seen int, string, float before, that's the world we're living in right now. Later on, we will consider something called variable types. Confusingly, it's not the same thing as a data type. So our variable types are going to refer to the qualities of our independent and dependent variables. If you watch the first few videos in this series, you know all about IVs and DVs. If you haven't, don't worry about it. We'll be getting to those more as well. All of our variables, the things that we're studying, if I'm doing a study of the relationship between smoking and lung cancer, variable on how much I'm smoking and a variable on how much lung cancer I'm getting, are each going to have a variable type that's going to reflect how it's, it shows up in the real world, such as a continuous type, a discrete type, more on that to come. And that variable type is going to have implications for the data type, how it's stored. This is all very abstract. I learn more effectively when I have like kind of a bird's eye view first before I pop down into little pieces. So that's that, but it's, it's awfully vague. So, so hang on, we'll get more specific. So data type is computational. It's how it's stored in the computer. Variable type is more conceptual, not only conceptual, but it's generally what, how are we capturing this thing that we care about? Is this thing that I care about fundamentally a continuous variable or a discrete variable? It's it very philosophical. As you might imagine, I'm biased towards the philosophical stuff, but both are really important. All right. So data types in Python. There are a few. We're not going to use them all in this course. We've got numeric data types, dictionaries, where we have a key associated with a value, Boolean data types, where we can take on values of true or false. We have sets, which are collections of, of elements that are unordered. So 652 and 256, like we don't care what order they're in. Great. And then we have sequences which are items that are in an order and that order matters. We are going to focus in this course, I'm going to rename it a tiny bit. So get ready to get mad if you're a purist. We're going to be focused on numeric types, such as integers, which is the number five, and floats, which is a decimal, 5.0. We're going to be talking about strings, technically a sequence, but I find that unhelpful. Sorry. Strings are words, effectively. They're, they're denoted by quotation marks. So the word five, F-I-V-E, is a string and bools. So that's whether something takes on a true or a false value. More on those in just a moment. And within sequences, we're going to work with lists and arrays. Arrays are not built in, but we'll use them so much that I want to talk about it in context with lists. So, okay. So numeric data. Ints are whole numbers. So no decimal. So 1, 78, minus 200, 7. Yay. I'm an int. God, these graphics. Just keeping it lively around here. Floats are real numbers. They can be whole or fractional they mean that we're going to see a decimal. So 1.0, 3.14, 4.6 repeating, minus 2.0. So add a 0.0, I think that's a Cheerio, and now we're afloat. All right. You might be wondering, who cares? <laughs> well, when our data is numeric, we can perform mathematical statistical operations on it. So numerical data allows us to calculate things like a mean or a max or something like that. When would we use integers versus floats? It's not really going to matter in this course, but to have it in your head so that going forward you, you have a sense, it kind of depends on a few things. One is what we're studying. If we're studying something that only comes in whole amounts, we'll record it as an int, not just because ints maybe are simpler, they take up less memory, but because it reflects something about the world. So if I'm recording the number of cars on the highway, 
I'll probably store it as an int because you'd have one, two, three, four, five. You wouldn't have 5.5 cars unless you want to count a motorcycle as half a car, but I don't want to go there. So you, so you want to choose the one that reflects the underlying thing. That, of course, is related to variable type as well. So number of dogs in a park, I'm probably going to record as an int. Integer math is also faster. They consume less energy, but floats might contain more information. So there may be cases where something is naturally a float. The, the average temperature is 44.6, but uh, I could round that to an int, but maybe that 0.6 really matters in the research that I'm doing. So it's worth the extra computational power to work through them. This, this will not matter in, in our course unless you're practicing with a really massive data set, but integers can be of any length. Floats in Python are accurate up to 15 decimal points. So this means there may be some rounding, but it almost never means a lot unless we're working with really, really, really specific values. String data is basically letters. You can put numbers in it. If you put a number inside of the quotation marks, it will be stored as a string. It's a great way to confuse yourself while you're coding. But generally, we talk about strings as text. So we're writing them in quotation marks, double or single. So my string or quotation mark, this is a string, single or double. I tend to like single, but they're not always possible to use. We'll talk about that in a moment. Usually data that has words or letters is going to be recorded as a string. So names of countries, genders, universities, what have you. One of the biggest ways that string data is going to show up is when it shouldn't be coded as string data. And this is usually because the data set that we're importing into our Jupyter Notebook is funky in some way, technical term. And so we might import something like a year, 1989, and it will say, oh, this is a string for some reason to do with how the file saved it. And you're like, no, it's not a string because I want to find the, the maximum year or the most recent year or whatever. And so you'll have to manually change it from a string to a number. Another common way that this will show up is if you have data that includes symbols or words. So if you want to include data on percentages, so it's 17%, 18%, but it's marked with the word percent or uh, the percent sign, Python is going to automatically read that as a string. And you want that as a number because you want to be able to use it in math and statistical operations. So you're going to need to manually go in and change it. We have to remove percent, remove the percentage mark, and then say, hey, turn this into an int or whatever. And we'll talk about how to do that in just a moment. All right, so probably the biggest interaction with data types in your early days as a data scientist is going to be changing them because they're wrong. All right, Boolean data is truthiness. We're not gonna use this a ton, but it'll come up now and again, and it feels wrong to leave it out. So bools, we'll call them bools because we're casual like that. They can only take the form of true or false and those capital letters, capital T, capital F, matter. They are not strings. If I put the word true in, in quotation marks, it will be stored as a string and I won't be able to use it the way I want to as a bool. No quotation marks. Capitalization matters. And a Boolean expression is an expression that evaluates to a Boolean value. So for example, if I write four equals equals four, four is equivalent to four, it will return true. If I type four equals equals nine, I will get false. You can try it out on your own. As I said, we're not going to use them a ton, but they're foundational, helpful, and, and I'd feel weird if I didn't. So there you go. All right, let's code. Let's do some stuff. So, okay, we can manually inspect what type of data we're working with, with the code type. Type, as you can see where I've written it here, shows up in green, so we know it's a built-in function. So what is the type of whatever is in the parentheses is what I'm evaluating the type of. And here, hey, um, lo and behold, it's an int. What is the type of 3.0? Say it with me, float. What is the type of quote 3.0? String. Very good. And I can start to add my naming skills from the previous video where I can say course equals string, data science for everyone, interest equals string, things I'm interested in, and save it as those objects. So now I can quickly call up course and the, the values it contains, data science for everyone. Feel free to explore the single quotes, double quotes. As I said, I like the single because I find them cleaner. But in this particular case, you cannot use a single quote because of that I apostrophe M is going to get confusing. Uh, and so it will end the string there if you try to run that code uncommented. So you need to use double quotes if your string contains an apostrophe. We can change our data types. This is another one of those that's pretty straightforward, but it's still worth practicing to get your head around. So um, and it also kind of breaks your brain if you think about it too long. So float three, we can see they're also built in functions will turn the integer three into 3.0. If I say string three, it's gonna turn my integer three into the string three. Int three keeps it at three. Bool three will give me true. The way I'll get false is by just leaving that empty. Should be intuitive, 
You don't need to memorize this, but this is the idea. All right. So again, these are the, the two areas that we're focused on. So let's move over to sequences. So we're going to talk about lists and arrays. There are others, as I said, but let's focus here for now. So all of these are ways to store multiple elements. So the ages of people on my soccer team or the heights of students in my class. These are all things I obviously am measuring all the time. They can contain any data type. They might contain a bunch of ints. They might contain floats, strings, bulls, et cetera. And they can be indexed and iterated through. So that means we can say this is in the first position, this is in the second position, and we can say go through all of them one at a time or whatever. Okay, some differences. So lists are more common. You're going to see lists out and about in the world more often. They're built into Python, so you don't need to import a package. It's a built-in function. And they do not have to be declared, meaning I don't have to say my list equals and then the, the elements in my list. I can just write them and I have a list. Whereas arrays are a little bit more fussy. Uh, they're special, okay? They're complicated, but they're useful, all right? So they're not built into Python. We have to import an array. We're going to be using the NumPy package for that. They have to be declared. So I have to say my array equals, or ages equals, heights equals. It can't just be out there in the world. But I can perform some arithmetic on them in a way that I think makes a bit more sense than I can do with lists. So they're a little bit more functional, sorry, lists, all right? They're also more compact and efficient. So if we're working with, with big sequences, we may want to tip towards arrays. So basic sequence, if we want to create a list, it's represented by ye old square brackets. And this is where I always say to my students, you don't have to memorize this stuff. You will eventually as you go, but unlike learning Spanish, it's not like you're going to be all of a sudden in a restaurant trying to remember like, hola, como se llama empanada? That's not how you speak Spanish. That's not usually the case with programming unless you're in a class that's giving you some kind of like test, which I never do, where you have to write pro code from memory. It's nice to know how to say it without having to look it up, but you can always look it up. How do I write a list? Ah, square brackets. So again, you'll get it, but don't focus on memorizing it as the first thing you do. That's my advice. So I've created a list, one, two, three, four. I've put it in square brackets. I can also name it my list equals one, two, three, four. They hold these items in order. So that makes it a sequence rather than a collection or set. Something that'll take a moment to get, to get our heads around. The indexing of a list begins at one. So the first element is in position zero. The second element is in position one. This is something that takes like a little bit of time and then before you're like automatically starting at zero. So we can add and remove elements from our sequence by identifying the position of our elements. So I could write something like my list dot append four. And that's going to put a four at the end of my list. So now it'll be one, two, three, four, four. DEL my list brackets one will remove the second element of the sequence. So the second element is in position one. So it goes zero, one. So it's going to replace the two. And we're going to be left with one, three, four, four. Again, you don't have to memorize this, but absolutely practice it. Get a feel for it. Notice and test, we already have differences in here that could screw us up later on with square brackets or round brackets. The difference is going to matter, and we'll talk more about why it matters later on, but for now, just know that it does matter and see what happens. See what error messages you get or what happens in your output if you swap the types of brackets you have. Examples of lists. So I already created my list one, two, three, four. Wonderful. There it is. I can add four, like I said. Great. I can delete the element in the position one, which is the second element. So now I have one, three, four, four. And I can do a bunch of other stuff. I can call just specifically that element. So tell me the element in position zero, which is the first one, one. Tell me the element in position three, which is the fourth one, four. My list minus one is actually going to pull from the end of the list. Minus two is going to also pull from the end of the list. And notice the one thing I really want to flag here is my list times two gives us something kind of funky. Instead of multiplying the elements times two, it just gives us the list twice. And that to me is not how math, not the math I expected to see. So that's one of the reasons that we're going to want to go to arrays. We'll use them way more often. They are collections of elements in a sequence. In the case of arrays, as I said, they're a bit fussier. All elements must be the same type. So it has to be all ints, all floats, and so on. We are going to need to import a package or library to use it. We use NumPy in this course, and we write it in parentheses and square brackets. So import NumPy as NP. We are going to say NP as an abbreviation for NumPy. You could abbreviate NumPy however you want, but NP is how you're going to see it done on the internet. So if you do it as something else, prepare to constantly debug and confuse yourself. Debug yourself, yeah. So the way we're going to create an array is we're going to say my array, or whatever that is, 
equals np.array, one, two, three, four. If I had just written import numpy and left off the as np, my next line of code would have to be my array equals numpy dot array. So I'm telling the computer that it's pulling from the package numpy and, and, and specifically using the tool array. And by saying import numpy is np, I don't have to write numpy, I just write np. Again, you can say whatever you want. I strongly recommend np. So better multiplication functionality, my array times two will do what we thought my list times two would do, which is multiply all elements times two. All right, and we can do the same thing where we inspect the type of our sequence and say, is it a list or is it an array? And we can change the type. So here are some examples. We can say import numpy as np, my array equals np.array374, my array now contains 374, multiply it by two, lo and behold, we get 6148 like we expected. And we can do type my array and see that it's a numpy array. And we can say list my array and turn it into a list. So it's all, again, each piece is quite simple, but it's a lot. So, so, so be practicing. Last piece for this video is libraries and packages. I've been a bit fast and loose about libraries and packages so far. Um, but really what we're doing is we are saying, okay, there's code out there in the world that's helpful to me that someone else wrote. I'm going to bring that in so I don't have to construct an array from the bottom up totally manually. So we're using the package numpy right now, and then we're pulling in the little piece that we're going to use, array in this case. There are modules out there. Modules are a subset of a package or library. If you watched the previous video, you saw where we said import statistics, and then we said statistics.mean. Mean is the module. Or we could specifically go straight to mean if I know I'm not going to use the statistics package for anything else. I can say from statistics, import mean, and then I can just use mean. We're not going to get too fussed about when you do one or the other at this stage. It's kind of up to you. You will find out there in the world, and also in this very video <laughs> that I've already, uh, I've already done it probably, the words packages, libraries, modules are probably used interchangeably a lot depending on where you look. Generally, a package or a library is the big self-contained toolbox. Statistics, math, NumPy. When we get to working with tables of data, we'll use pandas. And those are the broad toolboxes that contain a bunch of tools. And those tools are the modules. So it's a segment within the package or library is the module. Don't get too fussed on the definition for practical purposes. I don't care if you pull from the module or the whole thing or anything at this stage. It doesn't really matter. There are lots of packages and libraries out there in data science. One of the reasons I say this now early on in our journey is that this took a while when I was learning Python for me to get my head around. It's really less about like, oh, I speak Python. It's more about like within Python, I have facility with matplotlib, pandas, and sci-fi or whatever. You kind of learn little sub tools. Like I know how to use a hammer and I know how to use a drill as opposed to like, I know tools. Does that make sense? Some of the ones that we'll be using in this course and are also just generally quite popular. NumPy, we've been talking about. Pandas will be when we actually are working with structures of data. We'll use matplotlib for plotting. SciPy and scikit-learn are going to be the backbone of the statistics and machine learning. Others that I like are, are a program called Seaborn, which can help you make slightly nicer data visualizations, and Boca, which will help you with cool interactive stuff. So it's really fun to learn a new package and kind of get introduced to a whole new world it's kind of like a mini language, each one. Is it a dialect? I think my analogy is breaking down. All right. That's it for now. There's, I feel like this was both very basic and also jam-packed with a lot. So especially if you're new to coding, have I said it before? Try this stuff. Just try it out. Get a feel for it. I promise it will become more natural as you go. Learning by doing. Yay, bye.